Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton and this is the first episode of my Dominions 5 Let's Play. If you've not heard of it, Dominions 5 is the latest in a legendary and legendarily complex series of multiplayer turn-based strategy games featuring incredibly granular tactics, large-scale grand strategy, a great deal of political machinations between the different human players, and an incredibly diverse list of spells with probably some of the most interesting spellcasting in any game I've ever played. In this series, I am going to be playing through my third ever multiplayer game of this and recording the experience for you. So what is Dominions? Well, in a quite intricately detailed fantasy world, the Panto Creator, the god who created the universe, is now dying, which means that every other lesser god, giant monster, overly self-aggrandizing, incredibly powerful immortal wizard, and so on, are all now fighting amongst themselves to decide who's going to be get to be the demiurge of the next universe that is created. In order to do that, you have to seize a certain number of thrones of ascension within the world, and then declare yourself the new god. Seems pretty simple, but everybody else is trying to do the same thing at the same time. The game uses simultaneous turns, so every individual player is given a game state, and then everybody has a usually 24-hour window within which they can program in their commands, order their commanders to cast spells, summon troops, recruit troops, move places, fight wars, do all kinds of things, conduct trades, all sorts of these things. Then, once each player has handed in their turn, or once the timer runs out, all of those commands from all of the different players are processed simultaneously. The game then spits out a new turn for everyone to repeat the process. Most of the communities I've seen seem to use about a 24 hour deadline for most games, which means that these matches can take weeks to complete. I'm not gonna go into too much detail in this episode, not only because the game's rules are incredibly complicated, so I'll explain them as we go through playing actual turns, as and when they come up, but also because there's a lot of granular detail just to the setup of the multiplayer match that I won't really need to go into. In fact, as an interesting historical note, note until very recently, these games were run with a play-by-email system, you know, like the 90s. Fortunately, we live in the future, which means that most games are now run by Discord bots, with an individual player hosting the game and then using a bot for the administration and uh, handing out new turns to players and so on. But in short, this is going to be a 12-player game, so myself and 11 other players. I don't know any of these people. It's the internet, they could be anybody, but I will probably have to interact with at least a few of them for diplomatic reasons as the, as the match goes on. So that's enough of that, let's dive in. The first thing you need to do when you are playing a multiplayer game of this is, well, first you need to sign up to the multiplayer game, join it, and do sort assorted other things. But once you've done all of that, you need to pick a nation and create your god. So I'm gonna open up a tool that allows us to create a god, and then after I've given a brief overview, we'll go into my actual choices. So there are three eras in the game. There's about 40 different nations that you can play, many of which have different versions and which can play quite differently depending on whether you're in the early, middle or late ages. We'll go with middle for now because that's the era in which our multiplayer match is taking place. As you can see, there's a great deal of them. Some of these exist only in certain eras and some of them are very different depending on which era you're playing in, but I have chosen one of the classic starter nations, which is recommended for new players, the Norse-themed giants of Jotunheim. I will go into the strengths and weaknesses of this particular nation after we start actually playing the game, but for now, let's have a quick look at gods. So when you're creating your god, there are three main things that you need to keep in mind. One is how powerful of a spellcaster they are. Another is their bless, which is a unique bonus, which is highly customizable that you can create, which applies to certain kinds of your troops, known as sacred troops. And the third are your scales, which affect how productive your lands are. So you have a certain number of points with which to create your deity, and you can split those between increasing your magic paths, which is how good you are at these different kinds of spell casting. Putting points into magic paths gives you bless points, which allow you to customize your bless. And then you can also spend points on your scales to increase how lucky, how magical, or decrease for bonus points, so how unproductive your territory is, and how strong your dominion is, which is essentially your divine might as a god, and acts as a second kind of territory on the world map. Additionally, you can choose to take an imprisoned pretender or, or a dormant pretender to gain bonus points. Dormant pretenders are available after roughly one year, which is to say 12 turns, and imprisoned ones are available in about three years, which is of course three times that. Each turn is one month. The second consideration is the chassis. So there's about 230 different bodies that your god could conceivably have. Every different nation and every different copy of it in different eras has access to a different pool of the same same gigantic list of options. Over the years, the metagame has settled into certain kinds of pretenders existing for certain different reasons. So what you want your god to be able to do is often very relevant to which chassis you pick. But these can be roughly divided into four categories. We have immobiles, whose job is to sit in one place and be a very powerful spellcaster and researcher. 
These are usually quite highly spe specialized and often used to give powerful blesses. There are titans. These guys are usually imprisoned. They are very, very versatile, but their main benefit is that they have a lot of different magic item slots, which means that they are most powerful in the late game when you have sufficient industry to make a lot of magic items to equip them. At that stage of the game, they can single-handedly destroy entire armies while also being powerful spellcasters on the campaign map. Then there are what are known as Awake Expanders. These are giant monsters that you usually begin the game with awake rather than imprisoned. Similar to a late game Titan, these guys are able to conquer provinces and defeat entire armies by themselves, but that power is innate to their powerful bodies and therefore their lack of magic item slots mean they tail off in the late game. These guys are what you pick if you want to seize a lot of territory early. These guys are what you pick if you want to win wars late. Finally, there are the Rainbow Pretenders. These are mostly mortal spellcasters who consider themselves powerful enough to attempt to claim the title of a god, but their main benefit is that they can be very diverse spellcasters. They have the cheapest costs for increasing their magic paths, which means that if you want to, you can have a very wide variety of magic available. However, the trade-off of that, of course, is that they won't be very high level in any of those particular paths. This also makes them very good researchers. So that's the basics of creating a god. Let's take a look at the god I have created for this game. Jotunheim are a nation of giants, which means that they have quite strong infantry. They also have very good access to certain kinds of spellcasting, but they aren't very good at research. I have chosen to build a rainbow pretender with a strong focus on research. So I've chosen the Great Sage, which starts with inspiring researcher, which makes other researchers research better. And then I have given him a wide variety of magic paths, which increases the amount of research he can do. He will never be very good at casting any of the spells in any of these paths, however I've given him a decent amount of astral magic because this will later let him craft items that boost all of his magical paths. And before I forget, those are the elemental paths, fire, air, water and earth, and the sorcery paths, astral, death, nature and blood. Aside from that, I've invested quite heavily in my scales. I've taken peace and high growth, which means that my lands should be very productive, however they won't be very industrious, as I've taken one point of, of sloth scaling in order to get a few more magic paths. I've also taken misfortune, which means that there will be worse random events in my provinces. I'm always a bit wary of taking this, but I needed the points. I've also made sure I have cold scales, because the giants of Jotunheim exist better in cold territory, and this means that the weather in my territory will on average be colder. I have specifically built this pretender with the hope that it will mitigate for my nation's weaknesses while also encouraging its strengths, which is what you should probably be doing when you design a pretender. But the ultimate goal is to get a lot of research very quickly so that I can get the most powerful spells for my unusually powerful spellcasters active in the game earlier than anyone else. After all, if everyone else is running around with small groups of infantry and I am summoning infinite skeletons, that's a problem for them. So that's Dominions, that's the basics. As one final note, I will be recording each turn individually and then stitching them together into longer episodes and explaining the incredibly granular systems of this game as we go, as and when they come up in those turns. So I won't be talking about episodes, I'll be talking about turns. Also, before I forget, I did actually record my first ever game of Dominions 5, but I was unhappy with the first five or six episodes, so I relegated it to a to Patreon-only bonus material, along with other test games and uh, practice runs that I've done before starting new Let's Plays. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out on my Patreon. Links are in the description. So here we are on turn one. At the start of every turn we're given a messages screen which is an overview of everything that occurred in between turns. Remember all of the turns happen simultaneously, the game processes the results of everything at the same time and then tells everybody what happened. Obviously on turn one nothing has happened previously so you just get a couple of flavour messages with information about the backstory of the game, which isn't really relevant to us at the moment. So let's dive in. This is the world map. There's very little to do on turn one, so that's a good opportunity for me to lay out a couple of basics. Almost all multiplayer games of Dominions 5 involve some modding. There's a couple of balance mods that are considered uh, appropriate to the scene, and there's also some mapping mods. The built-in map generator isn't very good, so the community tends to use MapNuke. MapNuke has a couple of different appearances. I personally don't like this one, but I couldn't find another game at the moment, so this is this is the appearance I'm having to put up with. This one is prettier than the other, but the other is a much is much easier to read. So, in super brief, this is a description of the currently selected province. These are the commanders who are currently in that province. This is a very very tight overview of my nation, and these are an assortment of things. These are system options, these are magic related options, 
These are the military options for the current province, and these are the buildings in the current province. At the start of the game, we have one province, and because there haven't been any other turns previously, we have no scouting information from the, from the surrounding provinces. This essentially means that you never do anything external to your starting territory on turn one. Almost every first turn looks the same. You tell your starting com commander to become a prophet, you tell your starting scout to scout, and you tell your god to do some research. Independent provinces are usually quite easy to capture, but some of them are very tough, so if you don't know what's in them, you don't want to risk losing your starting army. One thing to note is that most multiplayer games use a scrolling map, so this world loops as if it were the surface of a sphere. If we go south far enough, we eventually end up where we were. If we go west far enough, we eventually end up back where we were. There's also a notable quirk to the map nuke generation engine, which is that map nuke, max, map, map nuke maps tend to be quite balanced, so every single player starts equidistant from every other player. There's a three tile gap between capitals, which means there's probably another player here. There's definitely another player here. There is one underwater nation in this particular matchup, so he is obviously in the big ocean, because where else would you put the water guy? But, as yet, it's a bit difficult to make guesses. Since there's 12 players in this game, my usual plan of scouting out the potential starting locations of places is a bit daunting. We can notice that this is probably a capital province, and it's a wasteland, which means that might be Ashdod, because Ashdod likes to start in wastelands, and Map Nuke usually generates you on your preferred terrain. So, Commanders. Commander is the game's generic turn for any kind of unit that you can order to do stuff on the strategic map. So, this covers mages, scouts, actual military commanders, assassins, wandering minstrels even, almost any kind of any kind of entity that you can give strategic commands to. The game doesn't differentiate between them, there's no class system, it's just the capacities that something has, so a commander might have magical abilities, or a wizard might have the ability to sneak, you never know. I should also mention that uh, one of the mods that this particular multiplayer host is using is a slight visual alteration, so some of the sprites in the game look a bit different than they normally do. I like to document games in their original form, however, this, this is the match I could find, this is the match I could find. So, for example, when we start to see independence in these provinces, they won't look necessarily the same as they do normally. So, what are our commands? Well, we're going to have our god do some research, since that's what he's for. We're going to have our commander become a prophet, which won't actually be very helpful for us, because as part of building my god, I neglected to have a bless. I'm hoping this will pay off for me, because Jotunheim does not exactly rely on its sacred troops, therefore blessing my sacred troops is not a priority. You can only have one prophet at a time, and you declare any given commander to become prophet. This instantaneously gives them at least three levels of the priest spellcasting tree, which means that they can bless your entire battlefield at once, which is very useful if you do have sacreds that you need to use. But yeah, let's not get bogged down in too much details right now, otherwise we'll be here all week and it is only turn one. I have named my god Short King because this is an ordinary human-sized man who has somehow become the god of the giant nation of Jotunheim, and therefore I am naming my prophet compensating for something. It's a tradition in multiplayer Dominions games that you name your god some kind of a joke, or a reference, or a pun, ideally a pun, and ideally also that you then double down on it with what you name your prophet. So what are our commands turn one? Well, since we don't know where anything is, we won't be attacking anywhere. Research, we're sending our scouts south, for assorted reasons that I'll talk about next turn. This guy's becoming a prophet, and we are recruiting a few units. I will talk about what our units are on future turns, but the ones I'm recruiting for now are mostly javelin throwers with a couple of melee guys, and my first spellcaster. These spellcasters are pretty good, they start with three, one level of three paths, and then have a 100% chance of randomly having plus one to one of these paths, which means that generally speaking they'll be level two in one of these paths, which is quite useful. These are going to be our workhorse spellcasters for a lot of the game. And so that is it for turn one. So here we are at the start of turn two. It's very common to get a ton of proclamations on turn two as every single player declares their prophet. This is just an automatic message that's sent out whenever you declare who your prophet is. Looks like a lot of people haven't bothered to name their prophets, although this guy clearly has. But we've also received a direct message from Scalario. I think he sent this to everybody. This is a fun role-playing message. A lot of people like to do this because the in-game messaging system is very slow. You can only send messages once per turn. Uh, just like any other command, which means that any actual diplomacy tends to happen in chat channels outside of the game, but people will often send in-character messages from their various kings and gods to one another. So, once again, there's very little to do on early turns, so what I will be doing this turn 
is beginning to expand and I will talk about expansion and I'm going to talk about my geographical goals for lack of a better term. The provinces surrounding our starting province are this one, this one, and this one for ordinary plains. This is this is the most generic province type. They have decent income, decent population, and no special features. This is a wasteland, which is less productive, but more likely to have magic sites. This is farmland, which produces a lot more gold. This is a wasteland, which is almost worthless, but has a good chance of magic sites. This is a forest, which is very useful for me specifically, for reasons I'll talk about later. But in general, forests are useful because they produce resources, which is one of the three things you need to produce troops. And this down here, this is going to be my most important early game goal. This is a farming pro province, but this icon in the middle of it means that it is a large sized province, which is just a random chance that provinces might be large or ordinary sized, which means that it has a significantly higher pro uh, population. Population is the primary determinant of how much money something makes, so this is going to be an incredibly valuable province for this and various other factors. In order to take a province, you need to invade it with your troops. So now that we can see what some of the independents around us are, and uh, you can always see what is in a province adjacent to one of your directly controlled provinces, we can start to pick which ones will be easy and which ones will be important. This province has barbarians. They hit really hard, so they're quite tough to fight, so we're going to leave that for a while. This one has heavy cavalry, which can be also pretty tough to deal with. However, this province just has wolf tribe warriors and archers, which can be difficult for some nations, but it won't be for us. And over here, we just have generic troops. So these also will be relatively easy to take. Because this is one of my most important early game goals, I have to grab this province and ideally this province as well in order to ensure my income for the rest of the game. I need to head south immediately. Fortunately, I want to take a forest province early anyway. When you are recruiting units, they cost gold, resources, and recruitment points, which are abstractions of different things. Gold is how much it costs to train the unit over their lifetime, resources is how much it costs to equip them for war, and recruitment points is just a kind of a population limiting factor, I believe. There's a few different ways to boost all of these different things. So we're going to be wanting decent income, but also decent resources in order to recruit all our guys. So forest is good. And the way that these are adjudicated is that any province that can trace a path through provinces you own to one of your fortresses, you will receive the gold it generates each turn. Any province adjacent to a fortress, that fortress will suck resources out of it. So gold can come from anywhere provided it, it has a path to your fort through your territory. But resources will only be drawn from adjacent territories to one of your forts. And uh, the level of your fort kind of dictates what percentage of the resources generated are taken. So my capital is currently pulling 45% of the resources out of any adjacent provinces we own. Currently, we don't own any provinces, so it's only based on the starting province. The other reason we want to take a forest province early is because, unlike most nations, we have some troops that we can build without building a fortress. When you take a province, you can always recruit the troops that were native to that province. So in a barbarian province, barbarians, in an independent province, the various independent militia, cavalry, and so on. And in order to recruit more of your own national troops, you need to put a fortress down. However, specifically, my Veti troops, which are little goblin guys, can be recruited in any forest I own, regardless of whether or not I have a fort. So it's generally quite useful to grab forest if you can when you are playing Jotunheim. Something else that is worth bringing up is scripting. So the way the combat system, I won't go into too much detail right now, but the way the combat system works in this game is that um, the AI runs both sides of essentially a real-time strategy battle. You are able to script the actions of your troops for the start of the battle, and after that, the AI takes over. You can give commanders five direct commands and one general command. So for example, I could tell this guy to cast specific spells or to advance or attack or whatever for the first five turns, and then he'll have one general order to follow for the rest of the battle. Whereas your troops can be ordered to follow one general rule for the length of the battle. I'll go into scripting with more detail when we're actually doing more important scripting, but right now I've got my melee guys up front, scripted to wait for a moment and then attack whatever's closest, and my javelin guys are going to wait and throw their javelins and then advance to melee, while my commander sits at the back and just throws spells uselessly because he doesn't really have any useful spells to cast at the moment. Then when the turn's over and you get the next turn, you can see how the combat worked out and actually watch that real-time strategy battle in real time, processing over the course of uh, <laughs> however long it takes. So that's the important things for this turn. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Ko-fi or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.